Scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 37. Luke says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. That looks like the Jordan River. If it's not, it's a good imitation.
I want to give you a story this morning that comes out of 2 Kings chapter 5. Let me say, we're so glad that you're here. Whether you're here worshiping with us as a member of this congregation or visiting because you happen to be in va on vacation here in the Glade or watching uh, via the internet, we're glad that you have come to worship and want to study with us today. 2 Kings 5, 1 through 15. Naaman was the commander of the Syrian army. The Lord had helped him and his troops to defeat their enemies. So the king of Syria respected Naaman very much. Naaman was a brave soldier, but he had leprosy. In one of their raids against Israel, the Syrians had carried off a little Israelite girl who became a servant of Naaman's wife. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. When Naaman heard of this, he went to the king and told him what the girl had said. I think you should go, the king of Aram replied. I'll give you a letter to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman left. He took 750 pounds of silver with him. He also took 150 pounds of gold. And he took ten sets of clothes. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay, and he exclaimed, How can the king of Syria expect me to cure this man? Does he think that I am God? With the power of life and death? It is plain that he is trying to start a quarrel with me. As soon as Elisha the prophet heard what had happened, he sent the Israelite king this message. Why are you so afraid? Send the man to me, that he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came. He came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger out to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan several, seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious, and he went away, and he said, Behold, I thought that he would certainly come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and lay hand over the site and cure the leprosy. Are Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, not better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned, and he went away in rage. Then his servants approached and spoke to him, saying, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down, and he dipped himself in the Jordan several seven times in accordance with the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child. He was clean. And then he returned to the man of God with all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know there's no God in all the earth except in Israel. Picture Naaman as he stood outside Elisha's house. He had come with great wealth. He was willing to pay anything that he had in his possession. He wanted to be healed. He was willing to do any great deed that Elisha might have asked him to do. And then he simply told, just go and wash in the Jordan River. God wanted to know if Naaman was listening, God wanted to know if Naaman would hear him. And he almost missed it. He almost took offense. We've got better rivers back home. Why should I go and be baptized in this murky little creek of a river? My father, wouldn't you have done the great things that you prepared to do if he had asked you to do those great things? And Naaman... I picture him shaking his bowed head and saying, yes, I know I would. 
God wanted to know if he would obey. At first he was furious, and then he listened to reason and went. And he was healed by doing what Elisha had asked him to do. He was dipping himself in the river Jordan. He went down the fifth time, he was not healed. He went down the sixth time, he was not healed. He went down that seventh time, he came up, and the text said his skin was like the skin of a baby. Naaman was not a baby. Naaman was not an 18-year-old. Naaman was like me and you. Have you pulled back the coat? Have you pulled back the sleeve yet and looked at the spots and the marks that we carry with a few years of life. And yet the scripture says his skin was healed and it looked not leprous, but he looked like he had that fresh skin of that newborn child, just like a baby. And then he comes back to Elisha's house. I know there is no God in all the earth except the God of Israel, and he had it right there. I love this story. I love God's power to heal. I love the fact that God can be troubled to pay attention out of all this vast universe to the needs of one man. The king of Israel was so concerned. His king's trying to pick a fight with me. I can't heal leprosy. And the message comes from Elisha. No, you can't, but God can. How many times does that message have to come to us? How many times do we have to hear it? We don't get it in a text. We get it from the text. There is a God in Israel. He has the power to heal. And that's our God. That's the Father of Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's the God that cares about you today and cares about your last week and cares about all the things that are burdens in your life that you have to struggle with. He gave his son on a cross for you. Does that tell you anything about your level of importance in the eyes of God? If you hadn't thought about it this way lately, you need to think about it that way. God said to Naaman in this text by the actions of healing I care about you. I love you, if you will. I want to say for God, I love you. God cares about you. And all the things that are a challenge to your life and all the things that are a burden to your heart, God cares about those things. But wait, there's so many things that just seem to bowl me over in this life. Yep, that's life. But God says, you are not alone. To be healed, some people today would pay all that they have and go great distances and do great deeds. Mankind sometimes doesn't realize, although leprosy is bad, Although cancer is devastating, although illness can paralyze in so many ways, that to be separated from God, the God, the Father that loves you, the Father that made you, is far worse than any of those things. To receive the salvation that God offers, it doesn't cost us great amounts. He only asks us to follow He only asks us to obey Him. It's the same type of thing uh, that Naaman had to do. How many years did some of us put off coming to God? Ah, it's just water. But boy, is it good. Another one of God's gifts. God asked Naaman to obey. Naaman wanted healing. He just had to decide would he follow her or not. Brothers and sisters, friends, we just have to decide. We're going to follow or are we not? Are we going to listen to what God says? Are we going to go his way? Are we going to trust him? 
Are we going to keep doing what we have done? Keep doing what we have known to do and live with the results that we had to live with. I don't watch this Dr. Phil guy very much, but I love that line of his. How's that working for you? Not too well. Not too well. Why are we here today? Brother Allen, it's Sunday. I've come to worship. Or if we're sitting in Bible class, I want to know what the Word says. I want to be a good example. I want to be built up. All those things. Hopefully, it's also we seek to answer, how am I to follow God? Naaman received his answer from Elisha. We turn to Jesus Christ for an answer. And once we understand the correct response to the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died for us, was buried for us, and resurrected to life by God the Father, and we have followed that, then we're ready for the next important step. I hope you have a Bible with you, or at least you have the Bible on your telephone or something. If you do, I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. What we're going to see in verses 37, 38, and 39 is more than can be contained in one half hour's worth of preaching. I want you to think about this during the week. When we're done, I would like you to take these three verses and take some time today, Monday through Saturday, and just think about these things. Because we do want to hear Him. And we do want to know Him. And we do want to do an excellent job in following Him. Matthew 10, 37 and following, the one who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one who has found his life will lose it, and the one who has lost his life, on my account, will find it. <clears throat> These verses challenge me. If they challenge you, I am right there with you. Let's make three simple points out of three intense verses. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. First point. Is this saying I'm not supposed to love my family? Does my love have to cease for my loved ones, for me to be a worthy Christian? Well, let's consider some other scriptures. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. It's the right thing to do. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 6, so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on this earth. Would the Apostle Paul oppose the teaching of Jesus? I don't think so. So Matthew 10, 37 obviously doesn't mean don't love your family. So the next question is, well, what does it mean? Well, exactly what the verse says. If you love them more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Whether it's father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, if you love them more than you love Jesus, you're not worthy of Jesus. If you love them more than the Father, you're not worthy of the Father's love. When family ties overtake the place of God in your life, they've got to be moved. They've got to be reset to the second place. Because God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit's got that first place. Many Christians of the first century knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because of their faith in him, they'd been disowned by their Jewish families. They were considered dead by their families. And these family members often would do anything to hinder the Christian from live, living a faithful life before the Father and through Jesus Christ. Many Christians today know exactly what Jesus is talking about when they read this verse. Struggles with family members who don't know Jesus as Savior. 
struggles with family members that don't know the joy of being in the church and following Christ. They don't understand that none of us want to exclude our mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and sons and daughters from the faith that we know. It's too much joy. There's too much security here. We want our physical families to join our spiritual family. So, point number one, we're not going to put family members above our relationship to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Point number two, the one who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Verse 38. Jesus expects us to bear a cross in this life. That is not good news. We've seen what he did. We've seen what it cost him. And if that is Jesus bearing his cross and we've got one with our name on it, Oh my. So what does it mean? Well, it's not talking about us bearing Jesus' cross. He bears that one for us. He made that sacrifice alone. We don't have any part in that. It's not talking about wearing a cross of gold around your neck. I think it's fine to have a piece of jewelry in the shape of a cross to let people know where we stand and to remind us when we look in the mirror or when we reach up and touch that thing, our commitment to God that we have decided to make. Many people wear jewelry in the form of a cross that lives some pretty ungodly lives. So what does it mean to bear a cross? For Jesus, it meant that he was going to take his place in God's plan to rescue us. So I have to look at that, realize that Jesus knew he was going to have to make a sacrifice, and he made a sacrifice, and say so that means, what's my place in God's plan to rescue mankind? What is going to be my sacrifice? He paid the price for sins that he didn't commit. He did it for our sakes. Where do we fit into God's plan? What are we going to be called to do? I can't answer it for you. It takes some discernment on your part to know how you fit. That's not for somebody else to tell me how to walk. It's not for me to tell you how to walk. It doesn't mean I can't preach and encourage you to follow the word and be what you're supposed to be. And you can do the same thing for me. But who we fit in God's plan, that's pretty personal. You've got to determine where God wishes to use you as you pray and as you listen for that answer. Even if it means giving up your life. <clears throat> In my opinion, one of the best things Dr. Martin Luther King ever said was this, and I quote him. If you haven't found something in your life worth dying for, then your life isn't worth living. God found something worth dying for the people that he created. And so in the form of a son, he came and God did that. When you hear his call and you find your place in God's plan, obey him. Don't just do it occasionally. Obey him, period. Follow him every day. Too many of us live crossless lives. Too many Christians live lives without a cross. We don't often realize that we're doing it. We don't often realize that means that we're not worthy of what he's done for us or for him. If we see a cross that's meant for our own lives and we reject it, then we reject him. If we see our cross and try to adapt it to our own desires, we're not doing his will. As I add that point, I remember I started out my preaching ministry in Hutchinson, Kansas. That's the first church 
They had the nerve to put up with me as one of their ministers. We had a local grocery store. And one of the local preachers of a church in an impoverished community thought their prices were too high for the people on the income levels that lived in his community. And he got himself a cross, and he picketed that grocery store. And for several days, he walked up and down in front of the grocery store, picketing against this store to get them to lower their prices, and he was bearing the cross back and forth and back and forth. I don't know if the cross was like this on the first day, but I noticed it on the second day, that he'd put some padding where it would go across his shoulder. I guess it was kind of making a blister or rubbing him raw or something, but he had some, some foam that he'd put on there that was kind of easier for him to carry. And I looked down at the foot of the cross. He had a little wheel that looked like it ought to be on a lawnmower, but it was fixed on a little U-type axle. And so it was helping him bear the, weight, bear the weight of the cross. And so here he was bearing the cross back and forth with pad and a little wheel. And I promise you, Jesus didn't carry his cross that way. So he kind of lost some of the power of the illustration that he's trying to work out in that. And for us, if we try to adapt the cross that God sends into our own lives, it's going to lose the power of whatever reason he's placed it into our lives. We've got to accept it. We can't adapt it. Point number three. Sounds like a riddle. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. How about it, brothers, sisters? Have you found your own lives and given them up for him? We as a people don't lose our lives too much anymore. There's too much leisure time. There's too much playtime available to lose our own lives to gain his. We don't often encourage each other in this way to look for sacrifice. The question is, do we spend too much time on the pleasures of this world instead of on serving him? We live sometimes as if this life is the only life as if this life is the real life. And it gets compounded. What if you have lived your life in a way that you have been able to retire in a retirement resort community where there's plenty of things for us to choose and do for ourselves? It doesn't mean we can't do them. It means our lives have to come second to living life for him. It's plain and simple. It's almost like point one all over again. I want you to enjoy your lives, but I want me and I want you to remember to put him and his life first because that's how we're going to make a difference to people that we live by and we respect and we love because we may bring the word and the good news of rescue, but we can't do the rescuing without him. It's his power. It's his forgiveness. It's his blood that's been shed. We've got to work to get our eyes off the physical world around us. Oh, God has blessed us. We're in a great place. It is his gift to us. But this is not our eternity. And when I see you and when you see me and when we see our next door neighbors, we got to keep in mind what that great blessing that he has in store for all of us is. And we've got to act in that way instead of clinging to this physical world. All right, I've got a confession to make to you. When I was going over these notes for the last time this morning about 5.45, before I preached them, 
I actually said to myself, do you really have the nerve to say that to these people? Can you understand where I am with this point? God has brought us great blessings to live in this community. But we are still called to put ourselves second to him. And one thing I'm convinced because I have come to know the family that is this church is that that is your heart. And that is where you are as far as the preaching of this verse goes. Lord, help me to lose my life and put your life before my own. And may he enable us to do that. There's a haunting question that comes out of Mark chapter 8, verse 36. What good is it if someone gains the whole world but loses their soul? What good is it for me to live 70 or 80 years if I lose forever? It's not. It doesn't help me at all. And when, when Mark wrote that down, when he listened to Peter preaching it, and Peter was recalling Jesus saying it, Mark put it down, I'm pretty convinced the way he heard Peter say it. I want to take it and recast it in a more positive way like this. What does it hurt to lose the selfish pleasures of life to gain eternity? Nothing. It's one of those things that's the invitation to the great banquet. You don't have to be hungry. Come and eat at God's table. You don't have to be without. God wants you to be with him. And I am so thankful that the majority of these people in this room today that I get the privilege of speaking to have heard that call and already said, yes, Lord, yes. But there's two other kinds of people in here. Maybe that class of people that has struggled in some way needs to confess sin, needs to ask for strengthening and come back. Or somebody that's listening but hasn't given their hearts and their lives yet. Is it you? There's, some, there's something within us sometimes where we just have a little bit of difficulty of believing that the good news is really real. It's too good to be true. That couldn't be. And yet God says yes. God says, I love you enough to die for you. And if you believe in me and you turn from your sins and you confess in your life Jesus as your Savior and me as your Father, if you're baptized Figuratively into the blood of Jesus, your sins will be washed away. You'll be white as snow, and you'll be with me for all eternity. And until I call you away from this life, you'll be my ambassador right here. For right now, for today, an ambassador to the glade. Praise God. So momentarily, we're going to stand together, those of us that can. We're going to sing this invitation song. But you know what it's for, right? It's for us to do a self-examination and say, how am I doing, Lord? And if we hear any of those things, that we put someone ahead of him or ourselves, our own lives, ahead of him, it's time for us to say, wow, how did I manage to do that? And set it aside. And come. And confess. Or pray. Or don't come. And just in your own heart, speak to him and say, Lord, you know I want it right. Help me have it right before you. Probably the most important hour of the week's right now. Most important moment is during this song. Do we need to obey? And if we do, why and where will we hold back? So stand with me if you need to come to him. Please come. I resolve no longer to linger, time by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, things that have allured my sight. All I will, in its 
sons to him, and his sons of God and free. Jesus, free this highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and sorrow. He is the true one, He is the just one, He has the words of life. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad. I've got good news. Sister Carol Barnes has been worshiping with us for several weeks, and she has changed homes, addresses anyway. She's been here, but she's made a move recently, and she has decided this needs to be her church family. And so your warm, welcome way that you have treated her in the last several weeks and uh, the way we approach God's word pleases her, and she says, this is the family that I want to be part of. So as of today, I want to let you know, our sister Carol Barnes is a member of the Church of Christ in the Glade. <laughs> and shall we bow our heads and say a prayer over that? Lord, we praise your name. We are so thankful for the fact that you have called us into your church universal but, Father, also into the church right here. You have blessed us to be a group that loves each other, has peace, and don't want to live for Satan anymore. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Carol. We ask your great blessing on her. I ask your great blessing on this entire congregation. May we bring you honor and bring glory to your name. And I ask the Lord, please bless those that visit us from elsewhere. And as they come, we're glad they're here. And as they go home, would you give them the power to honor you in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Nathan. Every arm comes and brings us to the table of God and the things he's going to say. We're going to sing number 962. If you know this one, sing along. If you don't, take a moment and just center yourself because we are coming to God's table. And this is that time where you are to examine yourself. And uh, not just in... in what did I do wrong this week? Because we have. But in what God has done for us, how much he loves us and how good he is to us. Let's see. Thank you. 
appropriate song to sing just before we have our communion. We believe that communion is a time for Christians to examine themselves, recognize and reject the sins in their lives, recommit to the Lordship of Christ and his teachings, and rejoice in God's salvation as we remember Jesus' body and blood was sacrificed for us on the cross. Everyone have a, a communion. If you do not hold your hand up and Bob's coming around to, to get him them for you. The Lord's Supper. In partaking of the Lord's Supper, I would suggest that we need to look in four directions. Looking back, we should look back to remember our past and to learn from our sins that were covered by the blood of Christ. We need to look inward. We should look inward to reflect on the kind of person we should be in light of God's great love. We need to look upward. Look upward to Jesus. As Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 reminds us, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, <clears throat> he endured the cross, scoring his shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God right hand of the throne of God. And finally, we should look forward. We should always look forward to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, verses 47 through 51, and paraphrasing, Jesus is the true body represented by the bread and the blood represented by the fruit of the vine wherein we are saved, forgiven of our sins, and Jesus will take us home to eternal life when he returns again. Remembering Lord Jesus as we now partake of our communion. Open your bread portion, please. 
and bow with me as we offer thanks. Father, at this time we approach your throne. So very thankful for Jesus, for your love for us, for Jesus' love for us, that he was willing to endure the very cruel death on the cross that we might have forgiveness of our sins. This time, Father, we take this bread which represents his body that was shed for us. Be with us and bless us as we partake. Amen. Be with me as we pray for the fruit of the vine. Father, continuing our love and praise to you, our thankfulness for Jesus' love so intense for us that he allowed his blood to be shed, completely drained from his body as the precious blood that is what cleanses us of our sins. We thank you for Jesus. Be with us, Father, as we partake. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. For convenience, our contribution box is on the table in the foyer for your convenience. Please bow with me again as I offer a prayer for the the offering. Father in heaven, you truly have blessed us so much beyond what we often recognize or appreciate. We thankful <clears throat> we're thankful, Father, that we can contribute to this congregation, to the work of this congregation, to the spread of your word in this community and throughout the world. May many hearts be touched, Father, and blessed by your love, for we know how much you love us and want us to come to you. We thank you for these blessings as we contribute and pray in the name of Jesus. And amen. amen. Praise God from the blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures, Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. It's so good to come together to worship God. Thank you for being part of it with us here. And may God bless you as you step into your week to see how to put him first and you second. May he empower you in everything that you need. And may your feet find solid strength standing in his promises. You're able to please stand with me and let's sing and just lift this off up to a simple kind of I love you.
Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and thank you for the ability to come together as a church family and to worship you and to learn more about you and to uh, gain knowledge to apply to our lives. I ask that we go into this next week, grant us safety, and we ask that if it is your will, that we can meet again next week to learn more about you and to worship you again. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.